It's Friday again. It's time for the next in our series, Fanzine Friday. Today we're taking a look at the Underworld Oracle, number three, from December of 1977. Please stick around. I'm AZ Mountaineer, and this is our channel, Old School Rules, where we celebrate the community of old school gamers and grognards who like classic RPGs, miniatures, magazines, and everything that goes with it. Each week on the Fanzine Friday series, we take a fanzine from my personal collection off the shelf for a closer look. This week, that's the Underworld Oracle number three by Lou Nisbet from December of 1977. If you haven't seen the series before, fanzines are magazines made by fans for fans of a particular hobby. In our case, that's RPGs with a focus on Dungeons and Dragons. We hope you enjoy today's video. Okay, as we do each week on Fanzine Friday, we're going to take a look at a particular fanzine. It's the Underworld Oracle number three by Lou Nisbet from December of 1977. Um, it's a light a green cover, heavy cover, and then regular paper. This one has one staple through the middle. It makes it a little odd when you're turning the pages. You feel like they might sort of wobble out. Uh, so we'll start with the cover, and then we'll talk about the table contents and look at some of the highlights. This is great art, it's from uh, Phil Alexander, and uh, I believe they make a comment in here that this is a, um, a druid character from, from one of their campaigns. The editorial talks about um, the fact that this remains very much a Dungeons and Dragons um, publication, even though there is an article on Traveler. He almost sort of apologizes for talking about something that isn't D&D. And of course, he encourages people to uh, make contributions, and um, he's got his table of contents down here, but I'll give it to you a little easier to read. At the editorial DMs forum uh, here, um, which is an idea to simplify um, how to calculate to hits. Um, being familiar with the game, this seems more complicated to me. I think it's trying to get towards a concept of Thaco, but um, it's got a bunch of pluses and modifiers you do, and then you subtract something, and. Like I said, to me it's all math and you just figure it out one way or the other um, in the end. New monsters. Um, they've got some new monsters from the, the creators and this also this is the issue that has a monster competition from submissions from readers. And so we'll have a fun game to play with that here in a minute. His opinion on the rules is essentially let the DM make the rules. Unless he's killed your character over something that you know doesn't follow the rules, you know, just let it go and keep moving is sort of his idea. And then he said, now in between games, you have rules to make up, like, you know, make up good rules, make the game simpler, faster, funner, have at it. But don't get in arguments at the game table. He's got a review of what at the time is a new game called Traveler, and we all know now that it was super successful sci-fi uh, game. Corner of the Dungeon, which is a drop-in encounter, Halls of Testing, which is their adventure, has some DM comments, has a play test, um, scribe notes, which are letters, uh, Trolls, which is the comic, Contacts, which is a list of uh, you know people's names and addresses to get together to play, uh, Overworld, which is a follow-up to his original review of the city-state of the Invincible Overlord, uh, and here he's saying, um, you know, from his own campaign, look, you have all these NPCs you encounter, like those need to have consequences. So you bully somebody, you take advantage of somebody, you kill somebody in the in, in that city, like make sure they have friends and family that would follow up and try and find the people who did it and make them pay, right? So he said, make sure your players know that their actions have consequences. Um, and then Illusion Forge, which is new magic items. Here's our contributors, Lou and Phil, uh, per usual, and then some new folks here added to the list. So here are the new monsters. Um, I think this these two pages are actually theirs, and then the next page we start with the competition. So, but, so here I'm going to throw it open to the whole thing, right? Here's the question. Um, in the comments down below. What's your favorite monster from the um, submissions? And next month I'll tell you what they picked as well as my own personal favorite from, from the list. Okay, gibbers are little goblin-like creatures. They're very adept with their very sharp swords they like to use. They come out four to 400 and they cause lots of havoc and problems. Death dogs, hairless two-headed dogs, their bite, um, can cause disease, has the effect of a poison over four to 24 days if you don't take care of it. Kind of like that, it's a creative one. Um, so, you know, that latent damage and something that your characters obviously get motivated to get back to town and get taken care of. These next three go together, I love it. The first one's honey slime. Slime looks like honey. Its real effect is if it touches you, you touch it, um, it'll cause paralysis. 
you know, save. Uh, then you have the macropods, which have which are the drawing here with this. It's this anteater-like face. It's got these weird-looking legs that can kick essentially really hard, like a kangaroo. They're intelligent. They can use weapons. Um, and their big thing is they're always around the honey slime because they love it. They eat it. And something about their bloodstream has developed a tolerance or symbiosis with it. And so they can they can touch it. They can eat it. No problem. Then they have these little things um, that you see in the picture. It looks like a little mushroom with legs called the agari. They're essentially the minions of the macropods. They run around and collect this stuff. They're not immune to it, so they wear gloves. And under the little shell, they have several arms, usually gloved, and they're running around collecting honey slime for macropods. But the great thing is, if you end up in an encounter with an attack of them, the little shield can come off, and then they have a little circle with really sharp swords on it. They spin and fling at you like a, um, like a frisbee. Or maybe if you're in melee, they, it just spins and you get chopped as it spins around. So I thought that was really cool. And then over here on the, on the side, we have the spike head, which is looks sort of like an ogre with a unicorn horn. And it fights. If it gets a hold of you, it stabs you repeatedly with the unicorn horn. So that's its, that's its uh, modus operandi. And here at the bottom, they mentioned that they're getting ready to try and create some miniatures for their game of um, monsters that they thought, you know, they hadn't seen good ones yet and they thought they needed. Okay, so here is the, um, here is the competition. It's, this is where it officially starts. Um, you should feel free if you want to, in your comment, pick something on an earlier page, that's fine. The Lost Tog. It reminds me a lot of sort of like a Brachiosaurus dinosaur. It says it's big, it's hunched, it has rolls of fat that hang down and, and you can't even see its legs. It has stumpy legs, like um, or great big legs like an elephant. Um, it has a long tail it can whip you with, with. It can wrap around you like a boa constrictor. It has a long neck, uh, face, um, it says it feels like a leech. I don't know, that's an odd thing to share. Um, and then it says it has all kinds of nasty tusks in the front. Uh, three eyes, two normal, one opens up and it's just white, but that white eye can sort of track anything up to four days, you know, I think maybe even without uh, overcoming the value of things that spells, like pass without a trace perhaps. It's very nasty, it's a very aggressive animal. Okay, the glutinous globule. I sort of think this is like a, um, it says milky white um, jelly. And it's basically a round blob, and it can shoot out tentacles, one, at, one per round, 20 feet long. If they hit you, you get a save versus spells, or you fall basically the effects of a sleep spell. No level limits on the spell, um, but you get a save, so maybe it's fair. And if it does put you to sleep, it wraps you up and pulls you into the body and starts digesting you uh, every round. Um, if you can do 10 hit, 10 hit points of damage to a tentacle, it'll get cut off in case you're trying to save somebody. And uh, if, you, if you happen to hit it with lightning, it'll split in two, and now you doubled your trouble. Okay, um, next one's a spirit. It's undead. Um, skeleton with ratty clothes. It has a chain around a leg, with a, or a, a manacle around a leg with a long chain and a ball. And its basic attack is it swings this thing, and it smashes you with it for 3d6 damage. Um, it has a few spells it can use. It can use um, fly, fear, and confusion once a day. And again, everyone always seems to want to add more undead monsters with good reason. They don't have any pictures and I wish they did because the next one a little confusing to me. It's called the Wall Shadow. It says it's a harassing monster. It comes out, it tries to hit. If it does hit, it does a flat six points of damage, no need to roll every time. And they say this is a great monster to use to annoy high level characters. I think the idea is these things sort of come out of the walls, hit you, and then just like go back into the wall maybe. Um, the Billower is a little red cloud of dust. It can go under cracks of doors, through keyholes, around basically any opening at all. Um, if, it, uh, if it touches you, it drains a level. Um, no real damage other than that, which is plenty. Um, and it's completely vulnerable to fire, so if you hit it with any flaming thing, it just instantly gets destroyed. Um, the Velador is a caterpillar-like creature that has a strong attraction to metal, or metal strongly attracted to it. If it gets within 30 feet, in particular someone in armor, they'll go rigid, they can't move, and they begin to get crushed. Um, as Lou points out, perhaps a smart person will get them, get them out of the armor, but if not, they're taking, uh, they're taking two hit points of damage every round until they either get the two things at least 30 feet apart from each other, or um, you kill the creature. Um, or, well, I guess if you die, then 
you get sucked towards it. Um, the next one is the Swamp Demon or Shaggy Thing. Um, and it's, I wish this one really had a picture because it talks about it has one big foot it can stomp you with, it has one tentacle it attacks with, so I don't know if the tentacle is like its second leg. Um, but it does say if it takes a lot of damage, it'll just run back into the swamp. And, and this is interesting, it's a very chaotic creature. If you have a chaotic evil creature in your party with a high charisma, it actually might be attracted to you and want to join your party. So that's an interesting wrinkle. Uh, next is the Amphisbana, uh, I'm not saying that right. Um, but whatever it is, it's a large snake-like creature. And it's, it's a snake body with a snake's head on each end. So each end can attack you. But my favorite thing is that it can, um, the mouse can link and then it can spin like a wheel and roll away really fast. Um, so I think of it as a little bit of a funny character, but I'm sure if you encountered it, it'd be more fearsome. Um, and its bite can do poison, so it's not a pushover either. And finally, we have the, um, well, not finally, on this page, we have the Dust Monster. And um, it's a curious thing. It's damaged by edged weapons, but nothing else. Um, and uh, if you hit it with something that's not an edged weapon, it'll create a poof of dust, and you have to save versus poison from the, the dust that you released. And uh, this guy's eight hit dice. So it's a very, I don't know what kind of dust it is, but it's a very tough, uh, it's a very tough guy. Okay. So the next page, we have the last monster. It's called the Dimension Roamer, seven feet tall, large bat-like wings, um, can teleport at will, move between planes, astral plane, other planes, prime material plane. And what it likes to do is come, um, basically come and, it's, it's evil and likes to come and basically capture your characters and take them away. And so what it will do is get close and put the, wrap those wings around your character. Um, and then you have to save versus spells, negative three, um, and it'll put you to sleep and uh, paralyze you and take you away. Um, it does say it's it's a great character to use for adventure threads, so maybe he takes one member of the party and you've got to go after him, or you're, defeating, you're fighting him and he shifts away into another plane and so you go after him to defeat him. Um, so anyway, creative character um, for sure. Okay, so that's the, that's the last one. Uh, so please in your comments down below if you leave a comment, you know, add to the end or make it just a separate comment and tell me which of these monsters would you pick as your favorite new monster for the monster competition. And then next video I'll tell you what I picked as well as I'll obviously reveal what was picked by the um, publishers of the, of the fanzine. Okay, so Corner of the Dungeon is a drop-in encounter. You go into a room, there's a giant chessboard, there's an evil magic user or some other kind of evil guy on the far side and he compels you to play chess. The first person in is the White King, and then he or she can decide where to place everybody else, uh, all your other player characters and henchmen. They say, you know, make sure you have an alternative uh, available in case they don't have 16 people in their party. And he's got all these monsters on his side for the black pieces. You move like you would in chess, so he says you're going to need a chessboard to keep track of this. And then when two pieces encounter, unlike chess, right, where the person moving wins, uh, here, when you move into an, uh, the same space, those two people, you roll and you fight. And whoever wins stays and the other person's gone. Um, if you win, congratulations. Um, if you lose, the White King uh, has to become a member of his uh, chessboard and be joins the black team, if you will. The rest of you can leave if you didn't get killed. Um, and then, uh, you know, maybe you mount a rescue mission. Maybe <laughs> if you don't. Uh, here's the Halls of Testing, the adventure for this episode. Last time it was uh, fighters, this time it's magic users. And so you've got this uh, dungeon you go through um, if you're successful. It says, this, they say here, unlike the rules, um, if you gain enough experience points while you're in there, you should level up, I guess because it becomes harder as you move along. Um, and so you'll either, you know, obviously fail or you succeed by getting through, in which case you can gain a level or two. As I mentioned last time, um, it's an interesting concept. It's a great idea if you have someone who wants to start at first level and catch up like your rest of your party second or third level. Just drop in this thing or something like it. And they say in here, by the way, if you're complaining, which I guess some people were, these are too hard for first level characters, then change them. Just make up your own hall of testing. Um, balanced, so there's a chance the character doesn't survive, but also with enough experience that if you make it all the way through, you might gain a level or two. 
One of the great things about it is they have the GM appendix. So you know, they say like after playing through this a time or two, here's some ideas, suggestions, here's how to handle these encounters, here's some things you need to think about in advance so you're sh you know, understand exactly how they're supposed to work. So that's a really good helpful tip um, that they that they do here in the Underworld Oracle. And then they have the narrative, the dungeon playtest of someone who went through and survived. Um, and apparently there's some complaints that went, like, so it's not clear whether other characters went through and didn't survive and they only picked the survivor, or some like miraculously, as some people are complaining, um, their character survived when, you know, they think these are really hard, which I think is fair. I mean, they are pretty hard. So these scribes notes I put in here mostly because of who wrote in a letter. You've got a letter here from Lou Pulsifer and a letter from Don Turnbull, both of which are saying um, that they really enjoyed the, the first issue. Um, and uh, so that's nice to see they're getting that kind of um, praise and feedback from people who are pretty important people in the hobby uh, over there in um, their part of the world. Okay, so here is Trolls, the comic. Um, I don't know if you can see it or pause the video so if you want to try and see it yourself, but I'll give you the gist of it. They're waiting at a bus stop. This guy comes by and tells them the bus is not running. They say, how are we going to get to the movie on time? This Air Elemental appears and says, Air Elemental Taxi will get you there. He spends and whooshes him over to the movie theater. He says, now I need payment. I need the head of a character. And so they say, well, we don't have a head. And so he gets really angry. And the one guy looks at his friend and says, lops off his head, gives it to him for payment. And then the last scene there, they're sitting in the movie theater. And he says to his friend, well, maybe your head will regenerate before all of these um, trailers finish and the movie starts. Okay, so um, Illusion Forge, which is the magic items. I think these are really good, so I'll talk about a few of them. And I think the first group is um, from Hugh Kernahan, who was a contributor in the issue number two. The Whip of the Basilisk. If the Basilisk Whip hits, it save versus um, petrification or return to stones. That's a pretty powerful, fun item. Um, the Whip of Dispel Undead. If it hits, it turns the creature hit as if you were a fourth level, I think fourth level cleric. I really like that idea. Might not use it as a whip. Might make it a hammer or a mace for a cleric. Um, it might give it to a lawful good character and let you know let them have something. But anyway, that idea is kind of clever. I like it. And finally, a cursed item, the Whip of Strangulation, and you can guess what happens there. Uh, and then he's got a couple of books. You know, these books you can read that improve your, um, take you up a level, maybe improve an attribute, that kind of thing. Well, um, he's got one here for the Druid and one, another one for the Illusionist. And also says, um, when you read this book, if you're a magic user and you have the requisite abilities, you can transition class to an Illusionist. Just, you know, something that you would give some people a chance maybe to, to switch it up. Um, and then finally, he's got a scroll here for, um, or a book here for bards that will increase their charm ability with their musical singing. Okay, then we've got some that are from uh, Jim Ray. The bottle of attraction looks like a potion. You open it up, it attracts um, random monsters in great number. So that's a fun thing to throw in the dungeon to s speed up your characters if they're going too slowly. The ring of thievery, they say will increase your thieves' ability for pickpockets. I like this idea. I like the idea of making um, different ones for different skills, right? Just wall climbing, hide in shadows, whatever it might be. And the rust arrow, plus one arrow, hits metal, has the effect of being hit by a rust monster. I really like that one. That's a, that's a clever idea. Um, the staff of teleportation. Uh, if you get hit, you take damage, and it randomly teleports you somewhere. Um, and you roll for it, and you move in that direction. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, you could be teleported inside a wall, and that would be the end of whoever got hit. So um, it's a little bit random, but could be super deadly. And then finally, this uh, is turned in by John Todd, and it's called the Living Pit. So it's like an invisible stalker, but it's a pit. Um, can move around, and uh, when you fall in, it sort of like wraps you up and tries to digest you. Um, so that's kind of clever, uh, kind of clever idea as well. I really like for these old you know fanzines love the monsters love the magic items the adventures i mean it really gives you a flair for the kind of things we were coming up with ourselves back in the 70s and 80s at our home you know home table all right so let's look at some artwork um that didn't wasn't in any of the particular things we talked about this is an advertisement and the thing at the top it says is from death trap equalizer by tunnels and trolls i think it looks a lot like a cave fisher which i think was in the fiend folio maybe monster manual too anyways Good artwork. 
Uh, this is, I think, Phil Alexander from the article talking about the city state of the Invincible Overlord. Here's just some random people in an ad area. Um, I think these are orcs and maybe a ghoul up there at the top. And then on the last page is telling you you need to subscribe. Um, in the last issue, we talked about a monster called the Brain Fungus. So here is your illustration. It's a fighter with a sort of zoned out look on his face, and then there's Brain Fungus has landed on top of uh, on top of his head. And uh, it says if you don't subscribe, the Brain Fungus might get you. Okay, so that's it. Underworld Oracle number three, another great fanzine. I hope you're enjoying the uh, series. Hope you liked today's video. Feel free to give me a like and subscribe if you want to get uh, an easier way to connect to me for more content in the future. We're trying to do this about every week. Um, next two weeks, I'll be out of here uh, on vacation on the other side of the world. Um, but when I come back, I'm sure my batteries will be recharged and maybe we'll even try to do a couple bonus episodes to catch us up. Until next time, my friends, keep rolling 20s.